welcome to Kids at Home, another Kids at Home discussion by Kids at Heart International. And today we'll be focusing on how God can use the spiritual practice of service. And he can use that to transform us as adults and also the children uh, to whom we minister or, or parent or grandparent or whatever the case may be. So today's conversation is called Be a Helper. And I'm Gordon West, president of Kids at Heart. And my co-host today for this conversation is Becky Dietz, who has appeared as a guest before and is actually the brains behind Kids at Home. She, um, she puts all these wonderful materials together. So uh, welcome Becky from Florida. And our very special uh, guest is Debbie DiBernardi today uh, from here in the Phoenix area. Debbie is a spiritual director, a pastor, an adjunct professor. Uh, she is a uh, board member with Kids at Heart, also a mom of two and grandma of eight. And if it didn't sound busy until that point, the grandma <laughs> of eight is consuming a lot of time, I know. And we hope you are doing well this morning in your home in Arizona. Debbie, yep. welcome. Thank so you. tell us about, um, Debbie, you have, a, a, well, in my life at least, a unique position of being one of the first children's leaders that I knew who really understood spiritual formation and where those two pieces intersect. So um, tell us about how those pieces intersected for you. Um, probably children's ministry or any kind of leadership and spiritual formation actually connected for me probably if I really think about it back even starting in preschool because of my grandmother's influence however when I first got out into the work you know place as far as nursing I was a um, primary care nurse head nurse um, ended up teaching and I found that my leadership development and my spiritual development kind of went hand in hand. Every time I had another challenge to do something that put me, I was like, wow, I'm inadequate for doing that. You're, you really don't want me. I don't know as much as you think I do. Um, it drove me to God to, 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 to help me as far as what happens. And so I found that it would come up and as I relied on him more and had more encounters with him and just saw what he was bringing to me and other people or resources or whatever, um, I also saw when my heart was being broken by other things that, that needed some leadership to them or some changes to them. And so it drove me back out into leadership and again, drove me back to God. So it was just kind of this balancing where it, it, it continued to go. And I it, love that because Debbie, you just uh, reminded our listeners of, of something we try to keep saying, it's a process and it's a lifelong, never done process until we're in glory. So you started way back there in preschool with the early church fathers and, and mothers in the <laughs> desert. Uh, I, well, maybe not that far back, but way back. And, and, and I do see that in your life today, still that journey, still that transformative process, which is so exciting. And you know, Gordon, it is, it's all about seeing, it's about encounters, it's about relationships. And um, again, it is a flow back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yes. So all that to say, by the time that I saw in the church, the time that I was called to kind of serve in ministry with children and family, I did not see the real value place anywhere. It was almost like the church had been blinded or had gone to sleep. I kept saying, we're in a custody, a soul custody battle for the souls of these children. And it was like they had gone to sleep. Um, and I really felt that the enemy had deceived the church because from nursing, I knew everything that happened in the first few years and much less the first 12 years that really shaped and formed a person's worldview whether it's biblical or not their soulscape all of this is put in place long before they're 12 and all of a sudden nobody seemed to matter until they hit junior high on up i couldn't even find a seminary that had children's ministry at the time except for fuller had a certificate so for me it was a real wake-up call and for a long time you feel like you're crying in the desert and people thinking you're really kind of off the wall for a while but there were there were pockets of many people 
you finally discover that there's a lot of people that had the same feelings and stuff that was going on that they were actually being able to do. And so you knew it was the movement of the spirit because it was, it was everywhere, but it was just in little pockets. Back Fascinating. In yeah. I love knowing that background about where you're coming from, Debbie, and how God has prepared you to, to make sure that ministry to children is saturated with formational practices and the formational messages. And in a minute, we're going to talk more specifically about a specific spiritual practice of service. But if I could just ask a general question to give a little more background, um, I want to ask, where in your life did you first find the joy that comes from serving someone else, <laughs> from doing somebody for somebody else? I think it was four and five years old because I lived in my grandmother's house, taking care of two dying grand, great grandparents. So I always thought I was rich. She always told me because she had her friend Jesus and all her grandkids, uh, she was rich. So I grew up thinking I was rich, not realizing four generations, one house, we were, we were dirt poor. But grandma took me with her in everything that she did. So I was a little nursing cap. I was <laughs> grandpa's nurse. I, it was my job to make sure that he drank his orange juice in the morning and I had to keep a little chart, whether it was half or a fourth of the cup. So I even learned, you know, a little bit about math, even as a preschooler, but everything that she did, whether it was in the flower garden, um, in her rocking chair, I, it was kind of the ministry of the mundane, but she took me with her. She valued me and she taught me along the way. And yet she allowed me to be little Miss Independent and her angel of mercy anyway. She allowed me to be me. And so as I think back with her Bible open, she was kind of the, the original armchair mystic for me. Her favorite verse, I know, uh, where does my help come from? It, my help comes from the Lord. Um, so she would cry, but then she would laugh and she would smile and she would hug me. So even in what broke our hearts, or even in her generosity, we had a family next door with lots of kids. She would bake, give things away to that poor family with all those kids. And interesting, Debbie, you did something that I think is a, is an, you just explained something that's an incredible point for us working with children or anyone, but with children in particular, your grandmother allowed you to experience the spiritual practice, probably never identified it as one, but you were well aware of it by the time you found out about it. Um, and so, but tell me, uh, what did God use to catch your attention and invite you to, you know, really explore the idea that service is a spiritual practice? How did that transition happen? Well, besides having my heart broken and that led to joy that I experienced in, in serving even my mom when I was in junior high, um, it was a movie actually. <laughs> Interesting. It was a movie, um, and I think it was Bernadette, but it, it, it connected because it, it was all about healing of the body and the spirit and how you're guided, sometimes just by blind faith and things that you don't always understand, but you just do from time to time. And she had had an encounter. And I can remember standing in my room saying, God, I want to serve you, <laughs> you know, um, and I want to do this every day. And long term, I really wanted to be a medical missionary. Uh, that was before I knew that God would call me and I wouldn't tell him what I would do. But the heart intent was I, I had received so much love. I had had already my own encounters with God since I was four or five. And so it was this every day, I just want to give back. I want this to just flow out of me as this movie. Oh, and, and Debbie, that is, that is such a perfect uh, transition to our, our goal because that's exactly what we're saying. As, as busy um, leaders, it's easy for us to give kids things to do for God or things to do to keep them busy. And that's not what it's about. We don't want little workaholic children. Uh, <laughs> it's not to have children doing things for God and for others. Uh, our goal is that children fall deeply in love with Jesus. And out of that love, that this uh, this sphere of their life becomes a reality that they are they are so overflowing with that love of Jesus that it flows out onto the people around them because how could you do other 
otherwise. So you, you've said that so well, thank you. And, and how, would you, how would you define the spiritual practice of service? You know, how, you, you've worked with children for so many years and are so good with them. How, how do you explain it to them and invite them into it? What does that look like? You know, I, I had thought about this um, for a while and I had like several things that, you know, before that I had, had put down and several people, if you read, have some really good um, definitions for kids. But I think for me, um, it really is receiving God's love and sharing it with others. Mm. And so when you receive God's love, I mean, I'm Trinitarian. So, I mean, we, we were created in love. God's love is unconditional, of course. We have a saving love through our Jesus Christ, and we have a sanctifying love through the Holy Spirit. And so children, even before, because they are so open and they're so natural in the spiritual realm, um, and I think that there's a reason that only children and believers have ministering spirits that they're in divine service too to protect um, because they are open to, to this wonderful triune God we have. Mm -hmm. And this love just is pervasive. They are open to it and they have it even if they don't know what it is quite yet. And those of us that have received so much of God's love, it's in just being that branch and abiding that it can't help but see the needs. God sees the needs and he, he longs to be a good God in that. And that's how he moves us out, I think, to, to serve. So for kids to set them up, it's always in the how for me. I think that's the formational piece. It's always in the how where you, you create ways of being with God and helping them fall in love with Jesus um, so that it is out of that love and that sensitivity that they go to do and share it with others. And, and that can be in so many different expressions just in daily life. It doesn't have to be a major project, although it can be. Um, so maybe we will wait for the how for just a minute yeah. because we want to talk a little bit more about before we get to the positive ways to do things, I, I want to make sure that we set up some parameters because there's some misconceptions that we're going to have to set aside and get through. Um, Gordon mentioned before, we don't want just little workaholic children. And there are some misconceptions about what, what service is. And you've touched on it beautifully when you talk about doing things out of a heart of love. It's the overflow. But what are some other misconceptions that... Um, that we might have to work through um, rather than giving people a list of things to do. Let's talk a minute about those misconceptions. Yeah, this is something that reflects the love of Jesus is Christian service. But I think there are several misconceptions. And I think you've hit on one and, and we can very easily turn kids into little Pharisees, <laughs> especially elementary kids that they're in the season of they're wanting to try on different roles and um, different identities and, and everything. We want to make sure where that is really coming from. Um, and they really do want to please us. So it's very, um, it's very dangerous if we're not careful about what we show pleasure in. If we show pleasure in busyness, they will adopt busyness. Mm -hmm. And we do want to keep them with the freedom of not having any guilt or shame or condemnation, or even freedom from that frantic doing so that you or God will love me more. Um, that is, that is not what service is all about. Um, I like that is so important, Debbie. I almost want you to say that again. <laughs> like, that misconception that God will love me more if I do more good things for him. Thank you for bringing that to the table. It is not. And really service really is not rooted in doing. It really is rooted in seeing and relationships. Um, children already have spiritual eyes. They, they see the real needs of others. All are called. Um, sometimes it's beyond our comfort zone, even children's. Um, but kids, they notice the burning bushes, if you will. They can wander at just the daily mundane things, and they're able to turn aside and actually really see what the needs I, are. We, t we talk about young children being so selfish and, and that's really, a, that's unfair because I love, um, you know, many people think of Becky and me as the preteen people. Really, she was the preteen expert. I love early childhood. I'm, I'm a baby whisperer. I love the little ones. 
but how many times have we seen the two-year-old drop what they are so enjoying playing to walk across the room to another two-year-old that's crying and put their hand around their shoulder? They just, they don't have to be taught that, that it's an innate peace in them. And I have to wonder if that's because God is so close to a young child and, and we haven't messed up that relationship yet at that point, so... And that's a really good example, Gordon, of what, how in our resource guide, our definition for service is doing for others what Jesus would do if he were here in human form. And that they do. He would walk just, across the room and put his arm around you if you were good. Yep. Yeah. So it's not just finding a need and meet it. You know, that, I mean, it, it is, but that's not really what it is. I love, I love kids at heart fall in love with Jesus and commit to maintain that deep connection with God. That's what's going to empower whatever age person is to compassionately connect to others and especially even the outcasts. And if we have time for a quick story, um, back um, when I had some elementary kids and we were talking about outcasts, well, who are our outcasts, uh, we ended up somehow with the nursing home that the memory care unit because nobody goes there because they wouldn't remember the next day anyway. And so, so, oh, we have to do this. And so it was a matter of really prayerfully um, making the little gifts that we were going to be preparing the kids, praying before we go, because I really wanted them to be in the power of the spirit as we go. Because I wasn't sure how this was going to go either. So here we are in the memory gift and they each had about two people. So they they were able to sit down at round tables between, between two. They introduced themselves. They gave them the little gift and talked a little bit. And then they were to ask how they might pray for them. And to see these little elementary kids with these older people, eye to eye, reaching out, touching their shoulders, holding their hands, giving them hugs, and really being involved in whatever they were talking about, I was just kind of put aback of uh, what was really going on. The staff was amazed and very pleased, of course, but it was in, as I was praying, I was like, well, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do with it, but here it is. Uh, you knew our hearts. And as I'm getting all the kids to come up to say their goodbyes and just kind of stand up and kind of wave goodbye, two or three residents from different tables spontaneously at the same time broke out in the same song. All the residents, memory care residents, joined in in the song. And then the kids that I had up front, we just joined in and finished singing. Wow. Loves me, this I know. Uh -oh. And the staff wept. They were weeping. I mean, you could hear them weeping over us singing, Jesus loves me. And I can't help but think, God used just the presence, just the presence of kids to be Jesus' presence with them that connected to their past and reminded them how much they were loved. Debbie, we can just stop there. That story, first of all, was not brief, but also <laughs> was wonderful and shows us exactly what we want to do. But, you know, uh, we look in scripture and um, we've already hit upon some major biblical themes, but it's very clear in scripture that we're pointed towards service as a spiritual life habit. What are some of your favorite places to look for those references? <clears throat> Favorite places, well, it, it's everywhere, you, from hospitality to giving people a cup of water to how you treat your employees in, I think it's Colossians, um, employees, resources in Matthew. I mean, there's, there's This is one that's more, almost more of a, a, a major theme rather than a, a specific verse you pick, pluck out, isn't it? This, yeah. it's, it, help is just everywhere. Service is everywhere. Service mm -hmm. is everywhere in scripture, but... I can tell you what my service verse used to be. It, it was about a collection for the believers in Jerusalem, but I took it as any kind of generous um, service that we would be giving. And that is in um, second, uh, second Corinthians 9, 12 is the verse, um, regardless of what version that you have. But basically it says, this service that you perform not only meets the needs of God's people, but is overflowing in various expressions of thanks. And so for me, that is my service verse, but you can go to things like Ephesians 2.10, that we were all created as a masterpiece to do all 
good things that God has prepared in advance for us to do. So when those children ministered to the, the people in the memory unit and they began singing, it was overflowing in hearts of worship of God. What a picture. What a, what a, how that, I don't think the caregivers were the only ones weeping. I think God might have spilled a tear or two over that in just his heart being so touched. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect story to, um, to lead us into a discussion about the benefits that the children receive when they um, you know, have I, this. Let sure. me, let me um, share one more uh, quick story for me that, it, that is oh. so present in, in, in scripture. And it, you know, Becky and I had the, the great experience just after her diagnosis to be in the Holy Land. And so it was quite fresh uh, knowledge and trying to deal with it and wrap our brains around it. And I, um, it, I, I went to the Holy Land. I always thought people went there to experience God, uh, Jesus as God, you know, get closer to God. And of course, that does happen. I mean, there's a, a piece of that. But what totally surprised me was being in the physical location where Jesus the man lived and then being in the garden of Gethsemane and it just striking me that that Jesus this week was the one year anniversary of Becky's home going this story because I didn't realize the timing here this story becomes very personal but um, to realize that Jesus chose willingly in his full humanity to lay down his life for me in that very garden or something like it, you get used to saying, or something like this nearby. Um, and, and to just have that experience and to think, wow, Jesus as a man, as a human being, allowed the love of his father to flow out of his life into others. And what an example. And, and, and that day, I remember stopping and praying, God, if, if you can do that for me, then just help me to weather the, the future for you and whatever it is you're, you're asking of me here. So yeah, that was, it was just a, a special time. And of course, in, the, in our resource guide, Becky, uh, what story did you include to help kids really focus in on this? Well, um, we, we, we dragged their attention to John 13 where it says, um, it tells us the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And that um, John 13, 15 says, do as I have done to you. Hmm. Which I think if we can give children that understanding, that vision, that they can join God on what he, his purposes are in this world. They can join him as he is pouring out love into the lives of other people. That's life-changing for a child and life-giving to a child. Jesus washed the feet of his friends. How can, this, how can we invite children to engage in that for their friends and the people in their world? The benefit of that for children is just amazing. It's life-changing. If they can catch the vision that Jesus is still among us, the Spirit of God mm -hmm. is still among us doing these things, and we can live life with God doing those kind of things for other people. That gives them purpose beyond themselves. And in fact, doing them with God. Yes. Yes. And it gives them purpose, and it sets a life trajectory for them toward an abundant life. They can do that with Jesus. Debbie, I know, I know what your answer is, but do you see benefits in helping kids learn about service? <laughs> oh, yeah, it does really create a spiritual sensitivity, to, not only to God, but to other people. So it really helps them focus on something bigger than their individual life. It raises um, compassionate kids. Uh, any service that's motivated not by compassion is basically dead works, right? Um, so if we are serving in through and by relationship and connection with the power of God's Holy Spirit, um, then anything, whether it's just the daily mundane to, like the kids said, this guy needs a kidney. We need to buy him a kidney. <laughs> you know, it, it has to come from compassion. And then 
their lives actually become living sacrifices too, that they generously give away. I mean, this guy that needed a kidney, they made bracelets, rubber band bracelets. Do you know how much money people paid for these little bracelets? But that guy got it. Wow. Wow. You no, know, it's, it's out of, you got to pay attention to what kids are paying attention to because they're usually more connected to God. But when it comes out of that sensitivity and seeing the need and out of relationship and out of compassion, and that's willingly given away, and, we're and, raising, and you we're know, I, a little Christ then. <laughs> I want to be very careful um, to not imply that I understand um, or that I, I have anything other than a frame of reference of a very privileged white male's life. But I have to say right now in, in, in the tensions in our own country, I, I always wonder if those of us that have worked with children had done you know, more about this issue 20 years ago, what impact that would have across racial lines, across socioeconomic lines, across cultural lines, and, 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 I, and I think I'm on target here because I'm not saying I understand my black brother's life. I, I'm saying that God has done such a work in my heart that I want to understand it, um, that I care about it, that I see the hurt. And um, all I know to do is the two-year-old walk across the room and put my arm around, you know, but um, so I don't want to overstate, uh, I certainly don't have the solutions or the remedy, but I know that this area of service and of just relational uh, practices in general is going to change the future for at least one child that we can, we can have that with. There's huge benefit uh, in them recognizing that God is so good to us at our ugliest moment and that we can share at least a piece of that with other people. Um, and recognize that God feels the very same way about that other person as he does about me. And so how can I disrespect the one who God laid down his life for? Yes, and it gets very complex. We, the themes throughout scripture is, is, you know, as far as justice and has said love and shalom peace. Uh, but we can't meet injustices with more injustice. <laughs> um, but again, as we create that sensitivity, spiritual sensitivity to what is true justice, what is true love, what is true compassion and, and peace, so that we can be peacemakers, um, then it is a combination of both intimacy and action. That is who our God is. He is a God of intimacy and action. There's a book, I don't remember who wrote that, but I love the title of that because that's exactly what this is. Because if we do not have compassion, no matter what we do, it will not last because it is, it's not gonna have the power of our triune God within it. Well, and I, and I think maybe that's one thing I can say with confidence about our current situation here is that um, we can't do this without God. We can't do this in our own wisdom or our own strength. And, and interestingly, this is the theme we keep coming back to with all of these practices. We don't sit in silence and solitude to please God. We sit in silence and solitude to give space for God to come to us and transform us. And as we serve others, we don't do it to, to please others, although it will, to please God, although it does but we do it as an act where God can come and help us grow, help us understand others, help us understand. Isn't it fascinating? All of these, if I serve somebody else, I find out that God loves me more and, and not more for doing it. I, I have a greater understanding of God's love for me. I have a greater understanding of God's love for that other person. And I have a greater understanding of God. And so it's, it's us opening a space. It's being, it's practicing something where God can step in. And, and, and I think it's time that we practice that with our brothers and sisters across our own country, as well as those who aren't our brothers and sisters yet, but we pray for and hope that they will be. So, so maybe now's a good time for me to circle back to the point where I said, we're going to talk about some specific hows. <laughs> so, so maybe we, we can do that now. How can we invite children to engage in these practices? What are some specific things that we can offer to them so that they know this 
kind of a life with God? You know, I think it's, it's a life of prayer. I mean, you know, as far as teaching and kids at heart is very good at this. They have a, a lot of different ways as far as God loves me prayers, as well as God use me prayer. Uh, they'll have to go together. Sometimes we kind of separate too many things. Um, I know that some people say, well, we need to um, create some simplicity to create more space so that we can love and serve others. Um, helping children be content and experience that freedom. But I think anything that we can do to raise compassion, even in secrecy, uh, kids love to keep a secret sometimes. And so for them to be able to serve in secret, um, what happens? And then talk about that and, and pray about that with God as far as what is done in secret, because there's no recognition, there's no giving back. Um, again, in that simplicity, we are just being a God branch, you know, abiding on the vine and doing, doing what he wants to do for these people. He sees them and we're, and he's using us. He's going with us to, to meet those needs. What does that feel like? A secret nobody knows, you know, when nobody knows. Let's, let's get some of that compassion um, that happens. But I think a lot of it is just training us as leaders and parents and, and everyone to just bring children along with them, not just necessarily to mentor or disciple them, but to actually see what God is doing in and through them because they have a propensity to be very open and responsive to God. So actually they can lead us into this compassion. They see many times what we don't see. And a lot of times it is basically them teaching us some of the practices. Yeah. Much of the time. That's... Debbie, because on the, in our resource guide this time, we give some ideas for how they can be secret friends and they can do secret acts of kindness so they don't get the credit. God does. Yeah, I like that. That's, per that's perfect. That's beautiful. I like, um, I remember in my early pastoral days on a, on a large church staff, being at church and, and seeing the senior pastor walk across the campus and bend down and pick up a, a scrap of litter and keep going. And there was no one around to see it except me. I, he didn't realize I was there. And I thought, you know, that's the kind of thing that we need to be living out in front of kids. They, they learn to help. They learn by our example so much and by our bad examples when we are transparent and, and, humble about them, sometimes even when we're not, except that's not the, the best planned route. So <laughs> and I think it's important that even though we're taking them along with us, um, that we take the time then afterwards to reflect and to thank God and to continue to pray um, and to develop a deeper relationship. We don't want kids just to be in a service project and then it's done. Um, it's, it's really nice to try to be able to find those things where there's ongoing relationship within that so that they realize that the people even that they're serving have value and have stuff to teach them. Uh, so it's in that relationship that it's a give and take. But I think in that, that flow and the how, as we prepare ourselves spiritually and, and are transformed and as transformed people, we're able to transform, you know, through service, our families, our communities, et cetera, just by being who we are in Christ. But we need that time then to come back and reflect, where was God in this? Where did you sense mm -hmm. God? What do you have to thank God for from the conversation you had with so-and-so as you were doing this, packing the food or whatever? And then to remember that the kids are leaders too. I had um, a Boy Scout that wanted to do his badge, but we were involved in relationships with Kitchen on the Street for a school that our, my church was, was meeting in. And so he was so good about raising, he had the heart for it. And so coming alongside him, I ended up making him the leader and eventually just turning over the packing of the 625 meals every week uh, for this school. And wow able to organize and instruct the adults on what to do, et cetera. So I think we forget sometimes how powerful the presence of children and what they can do. And even in things that they maybe can't be a part of, um, you know, we, we <laughs> had administrative strippers, you know, you're not going to take them along to the strip club. However, they can learn that there's some people that don't know the love of God and they, 
and they don't know how beautiful they really are in his eyes. They can make special gifts and pray over them. And, 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 and I'll, I'll have to tell you, since I am known as a widower and apparently I'm being seen as the one of the older men in the neighborhood now, people keep asking me if they can help me with things that I don't need help with. I appreciate it, but I get the message. But I, I've had the children next door where uh, the girl was having a birthday party and they're Hawaiian and sh and they brought me a plate of food and it was, it, and they explained in Hawaii, we like to share our celebrations. How wow. endearing that was to me to find out about their culture, to get connected with the child. I've also had mysterious people roll my dumpster up the driveway for me. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, really, if they're going to help the old guy, rolling it down when it was full would be the bigger thing. <laughs> rolling it back in is not so hard. But how much I appreciate that and just smile to see that. Well, we want to invite, yeah. In, in the flow, as, as leaders and as parents, take the time to go to God first to say, God, what and how shall we do this? And then when they receive from that, put some action to it be watchful, and then come back. What can we celebrate? What have we seen God do? Um, it, it, it's just, again, it's that flow, and it's all about relationship. When you commit to your child like that and grace them and empower them like that, you're coming alongside. Your intimacy with your own child or the people in your ministry will deepen. We talked about journaling in another session, another discussion, and I have to wonder if a family wouldn't be wise to come back and debrief verbally and in writing and then be able to go back and see, look how God used our family to do this and look how, how what God ended up resulting in that. And you could even go back and remember stories and update them when, when you find out. This conversation is making me realize I need to walk next door and tell them how much that, I, I thanked them at the time, but the fact that I still remember it, I think they need to hear that. I need to go tell them they blessed me in that way. Yeah. Well, um, we are excited to have had you, Debbie, and this is, this is a, a yet another discussion in our series that will be up at kidsathome.org, kids with a Z, kidsathome.org, whole library forming there of, of various practices. And these are the kinds of things we invite you to come back and watch and rewatch and to share with others, to share with families, with friends, with grandparents who, who could uh, use these. There's also um, a Facebook page, uh, Connecting Children with God, that we would love to have you come and, and uh, post questions or thoughts and, and even We'd love to have some videos of you doing some of these activities from the resource guide uh, to go ahead and put there. And, and remember the resource guide is downloadable, completely free, completely reproducible for use in training families. So share it, please. You can put it in a church newsletter. You can distribute it. You can just email it to people that you think might be blessed by it. Christian schools, families, churches, it's here for you because we want kids to fall deeply in love with Jesus. So. Debbie, you are a woman of prayer, and we, we have loved having you here. Would you close us in prayer for this discussion? We would be so honored if you would. Father, thank you for this time. You have been so generous to us. We can't help but overflow with your love. We just need to be generous in giving it away too. There's, it's always pouring into us if we just take the time to be with you. And if it's pouring in, it needs to pour out, but it's never ending. So thank you for this time. I pray that you will empower leaders and parents and siblings, everyone around the world, to realize what a great God we have and that he has created and recreated us to do all the good things that he had planned long before we were even born for us to do. We just need to see what that is. So bless kids at heart, Lord, for their, their mission is your commission to us. And we do pray that we will continue to grow in love for you and love for others. In Jesus' name, amen.
Becky, thank you for co-hosting and thank you for agreeing to join us again for a, a few more coming up while Melissa's off doing her summer gigs and wow. her summer ministry plans. And Debbie, thank you so much for being with us and for all you've done for, for leaders globally and for me. So thanks, we appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.